HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network since 2009. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. This is Thursday, October 5th, 2023, and it's the night kicking off Cider Week in New York. We're here in the studio at Roberta's Pizza. We have two great people who love cider and indie folk music, so this is going to be our special cider and folk music show. So let's go around the room and introduce each other. Um, I'm Jimmy Carboni again, the host of Beer Sessions Radio. Elizabeth, upstate, what's your name? Elizabeth Ryan, fermenter, pomologist, and a cider maker. And one of the pioneers in New York State cider. <laughs> and Fee? Uh, Fee Doyle, short for Felicity. I'm a bartender, beer tender, cider drinker. I uh, used to write a bit about beer in those before times, um, but yeah, glad to be here. And now you work at Beer Witch. And I work Brooklyn. at Beer Witch in Park Slope. So Brooklyn. it's cool. So we've yeah. got someone who who is not only growing apples and making cider, we've got someone else that, that selects and, and sells it. So this is one of those shows where why why we want you coming into the city for Cider Week because there's a lot of accounts in beer bars and restaurants that want to know more about cider. And it, to me, that's always what Cider Week's been about. So, Elizabeth, a little background on you. I mean, tell us about the farms that that, that, that you run and a kind well, of quick survey of, of the... The different apples and 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 just a, just an overview so everyone gets it because we see you at Green Market but but we never can quite figure out which farm is yours. Well, for a really long time we had one little farm, Breezy Hill Orchard. We founded Green Market, um, but we started growing and people started offering us these incredible historic farms: Stone Ridge Orchard, um, Drumlin Farm, Adair Winery, and Millcrest Farm, and we just couldn't bear. You know, we were growing the cider business, we were growing the farms, we were growing other stuff. Um, I started, I went to Cornell and I I started making hard cider uh, in 1980, before any of you guys were born, 1980, <laughs> when I was at Cornell. Um, I started making cider legally in 1996. And I, most of the guys that were really the venerable old cider makers. I went all over New England and New York, and they were mostly, I hate to say it, dead. They were mostly dead. So uh, I felt I had to go to the mothership across the ponds. I went to England and I studied in Hereford and Somerset. And that was the beginning of many, many trips um, uh, to kind of um, apprentice and learn from Richard Sheppey and Julian Temperley and, and some of these legendary guys. And what I, what I found there was the thing they make called scrumpy was the thing that I fell the most in love with. And that was this rustic, unfiltered farm cider, unsulfided. And we had no analog in the market in, in America. I mean, we, we used to drink a lot of that stuff. Um, 
but we stopped, whether it was prohibition, whether it was switching to green bees, beer, whatever. So I wanted to kind of rediscover the category. And that was the beginning of my journey. So I like I like that you brought that up because I, I was earlier I was talking with Fee and I remember that this start from my my journey in cider started with cider, the first cider week in twenty eleven. And I remember it, it was like just discovering. It was like there's the classic styles in Spain and in England and, and France. And then it's like who who's making cider in in you know the, the northeast and is it still, is it is it sparkling? And I think it was it was 2016 when I was with Andy Brennan from Aaron Burr, and he said, "Listen, I've got something that we don't sell, but it's it's only for mm-hmm. our CSA. It's called Scrumpy," and I thought I loved it. Mm-hmm. So w- w- what I, I'm seeing as things evolving now, it's kind of like the old school is what everybody wants. And I love the other day you yeah. said you're, you're making a Scrumpy now. And remember, for like 10 years, everyone was talking about heritage apples and heirloom apples, and now we're back to Scrumpy. Um, we, you know, let, let's talk about Scrumpy. This is yeah. a cool show. This is the Scrumpy show now. And I, I've never actually heard of the term Scrumpy until today. So this is a, a great learning moment for me. Yeah. Well, what, what is Scrumpy? Like, you know. Okay. You, you had to ask Jimmy, you just opened <laughs> Pandora's box. <laughs> so when I first went to England, you drive around and you see these little signs by the side of the road, they say Scrumpy. And everybody knows what it is. It's, it's farm cider. Um, you buy it, you know, they sell it in the barn. And it, it means that it's rough and it's raw and it's unprocessed and it's unfiltered. And the term scrumpy has been around for a very long time. It's, you know, probably Elizabethan. It, oh. and, and there's a term called scrumping for apples. And that means getting the windfalls or mm. or stealing apples but there are many other some of which I cannot say on the air but <laughs> not safe uh, for we work. launched with what we called farmhouse scrumpy in 96 and we when we start going into Irish and English beer bars in New York um, you know we we learned really fast that there are a lot of other um, popular culture uh, terms of art <laughs> that Scrumpy meant, and um, and I, I, maybe I'll leave it at that. But I'll leave it to your imagination. But you know, there's always been a close association with cider and sex and mm-hmm. orchards and apples. It goes back to the Ooh, Bible, the Bible, Adam and, and Eve. Yeah. You know, so Scrumpy. In England means a raw fresh cider, but there there are many other ways people use the word scrumpy. Maybe you can so. elaborate because this is a, an adult show, it's a twenty one <laughs> plus show. <laughs> well, you know, it it, it basically it means um, you know to have sex. I mean, it's a kind of euphemism for fuck in some ways. So, um, All right, scrumping, scrumping. scrumping for apples. And, um, you know, any way you slice it, it's a fun, delicious thing, okay? Yeah. It, is, it is the best, and um, it is, it is uh, the least tampered with. And when I studied cider making, and I went and I took Peter Mitchell's great course in Hereford, and I was one of the first Americans to go over there, uh, we were, people were still being taught to, um, to sulfite the ciders, first of all, to kill all the wild natural yeast. And, you know, pretty standard winemaking of, you know, the 50s before the movement. And then you were taught to inoculate with a very carefully selected yeast, usually champagne yeast. Um, That's a hard, fast ferment, champagne yeast, but it it works really well um, with apples. And then people would filter ciders and then they would sulfite them and they'd stick them in a bottle and 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 they you know it was expected that they had to be able to ship and they had to be around for a while and sometimes people would carbonate them and false carbonate them for, force carbonate them so that's the way I was taught to make cider and like Andy I always made scrumpy and sold it and we sold it in the farmers markets and our distributors 
honestly, I'm curious about your end of things. I mean, people fought me tooth and nail. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. It was quote unquote unstable. What a horrible thing. It had bits and pieces and leaves in the bottles. People found that horrifying uh, in some places. And what when Wasail opened, I have Dan Pucci, the great Dan Pucci, um, um, he got it right away. And we always had a draft line for our scrumpy there. And um, and they poured a lot of our scrumpy. Good job, Dan. Hey, if you, um, evolution of styles, you know, you've, you've been serving craft beverages for a number of years. Yeah. Um, how have you seen cider evolve? And Well, I... I think one of my my favorite things in, in being like more a, a beer centered service is cider. There is just a kind of a background developing taste for it, or maybe more of an underground thing that I think um, people who crave as much like variety as they would in their beer, like balance of acidity, uh, tannins, um, and just like variants of mouthfeel, all these things we look for in like a pleasing beverage. Uh, introducing people to cider is really one of the most exciting things because it's just, um, I mean, very undersung and it's refreshing and very different ways. Um, and especially, you know, we're all in New York State and I know, Jimmy, you talk about um, revitalizing the Northeast uh, agriculture in many ways that it, it is like a traditional beverage for this area of the country. Um, and I, that's what I nerd out and get passionate about, like historically, um, as in terms of like being in the bar and serving it to someone who like at beer, Witch, we have, we have a dedicated cider line. Um, I believe right now we have, a New York cider company, uh, there up in Ithaca, um, I think it, it's this option that's presented that people just go, oh, um, yes. And it frequently, it translates to wine drinkers the easiest because of the, the fermentation and the processes are a lot more similar than as opposed to beer making. Um, Sophia, it does have beer, which how many lines of, of beer do you have on tap? And then there's one line of cider. Uh, we have 13 lines. Uh, we'll have one or two ciders at one time but always at least one yeah yeah i think that's a good way to introduce people to it yeah yeah, yeah. hey elizabeth what did you just pour because i know you've got a whole bunch of ciders <laughs> in front sounded, of you sounded sounded nice yeah. yeah did did you hear i was actually just <laughs> yes um, basic so i've got four ciders in front of me let's do one at a time all... and then we'll tell you what we're drinking but i want to keep talking that, about this scrumpy right. because i feel like scrumpy is now and I feel like it's it's what's going to set cider apart. I feel like we had the growing stages, and then it was like, okay, let's talk about the historic apples. But um, at some point, that's exciting, but not really. And it's really what's in the glass, mm-hmm. right? And if I'm at whether I'm at Beer Witch or some other place, if I got a, if I got a glass of Scrumpy, I'm sure that Wasail with Dan Bucci, he got it right away. So, what are you drinking? Well, so. I have four things. Do you want me to talk about just one? Do one at a time, I've, yeah. And then we'll talk about okay, something so, else. So, so the, the first one I'm drinking, it's such a huge classic. It's almost, you know, a lot of people make it, but it's Northern Spy. And Northern Spy is um, a New York State apple that originated in the 1830s. Um, it's a classic. It's grown all over the country. But there's something about a spy, and it's, you know, it's, it's got, to me, a very distinctive um, taste, uh, and um, it's it's a little bit, it's always pretty, I know it sounds like such a truism to call it apple or green apple or or fruit forward, but it's all of, it's all of those things, and um, that's what I'm drinking. I'm looking at it, it's got this gorgeous color, and it's, it's pet nat. There's a fine line between pet nat and scrumpy. Maybe there's no line at all, <laughs> but it's got this beautiful mouthfeel because it's 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 got a very fine bubble to it. Mm. 
And that's always a little tricky for me as a cider maker. I've got to catch it and I've got to bottle it in exactly the right moment. And it's not very forgiving. And um, when Andy first started, he had on the back of his labels, and I loved this, and it said, sometimes effervescent. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was genius, <laughs> genius. So how, how, do, how do you find that moment? I mean, mm. and how, like, how long is it? Just tell us the steps. So you, you, you grind and press, right? Well, the, so if I can just nerd out a little bit, you, you got to have good apples. I, uh, you know, they've got to be picked. And there's a great temptation. And this is a wet year, to be honest. I'm struggling with the apples. Because everyone is because we've had so much rain. It's, it's like wine. We have wet fruit. And I need to get the sugars up. I am like holding back from picking so many Mm. things. It's making the guys who work for me literally crazy. (laughs) They want to pick. They want to pick this fruit. The color's amazing. And I'm like, taste these wine saps. They suck. They're not there yet. The sugar isn't there. They're like so wet from all this rain. So I think they're going to sugar up today's, um, it it dried out. So I'm looking for, as a producer, I'm looking for sugar and acid and flavor. Like I need that sweet spot. And and you would think it just happens every year. And that is weather driven. That's terroir. Mm. That is soil, growing practices, and weather. So that's the first thing. Then you want to hold as much of the aromatics and the polyphenols and all these, like apples have like two, 300 flavor compounds. It's insane. And so you're trying to hold as many of them. And the factors are, first of all, they have to be there in the first place. So that's that ripe aromatic. You all know, you know the difference between a green pear and a, and a ripe pear. Mm. And so we want that ripe apple, ripe pear. In France, they like lay the fruit out on the ground and they sweat the apples to get the flavor up, to intensify aroma. Nobody hardly does that in America. Every year I want to do it, but I just like don't quite have um, the moxie, the time. There's so much going down. There's so much fruit to be picked. What would that, Um, sorry to interject, what would that sweating the apples, what does that look like practically on the farm? Is it laying them out just in a controlled sun? Yeah, if you drive around, you literally see tarps down on the ground and you see these mountains of apples and they're drying out. They're desiccating a little bit. Mm. It's sort of a natural process and they're just big heaps of them. Hmm. And they're letting them begin, and you'll see the skins get all kind of crinkly and gnarly. And it's it's lowering their yields. So they're intensifying the flavor. Right. They don't do it much in England. It takes patience. And, it, you know, it's so embedded in their practice. Even if you go to some of the factory ciders, you drive in, and there's all these big, you know, piles of apples sitting around what is that process it's, called because i know it's like it's when you taste something like a vol cider it, we call it sweating. sweating i call it sweating um i'm sure there's a, a delightful french term yeah. for it but i don't i don't remember and and you 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 lose yield so um you know you you're going to press that fruit and instead of getting three gallons to a bushel you're going to get like two gallons. You're going to mm. call it the angel share or whatever. You're going to sacrifice some volume. So it's it's more labor intensive, but you're literally also cutting your yields down. But you're getting better, getting flavor. Yeah, you're pursuing you're, flavor. Interesting. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's time honored over there. Um, but the way they do everything is so different. And so here, you know, we're always in a hurry. We are always trying. We pick the apples. Mm. Um, a lot of times we don't have the patience. And a lot of these cultivars, these heirloom varieties, they're actually not picked until late October or even November. And so Macintosh, a lot of these culinary apples that people want to eat, the true cider apples are very, very different. And um, I'm, I'm 
I just really want to thank you for making the commitment to these cider lines, by the way. I just, mm. Pure Witch is kind of a famous place. And um, we don't, we, we only self-distribute now. So, you know, it's been harder for us to get our ciders into these markets. But, um, but it's, it's, it's so important. And I just thank you. And it's such yeah. a natural Really, the growth for a lot of years, we all thought that cider was kind of aligned with wine. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it was sold in a, in a wine bottle and you saw it on a shelf. And the growth in cider has come from craft beverage, period, from mm -hmm. craft beer, period. And this whole wave of this generation of, of younger people, so to speak, who just like, they'll drink, I don't want to say they'll drink anything, maybe they'll drink anything, but they're, they're <laughs> inc incredibly experimental and embracing of craft. And it's fueled the cider thing. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's interesting too. It's, this is a, like a, a go-to thing that um, cider and wine is connected, but specifically like, natural wine and sour beers. There's all these really interesting intersections. Um, and I know in terms of like Beer Witch having a dedicated cider line, like it's my boss owner, Krista. It's one thing I say all the time of when I like someone comes in for the first time, it's like the this tasting room, Beer Witch, the bar, we like seek to represent like beer on the entire spectrum. And like, Cider is a part of, you know, it's a best friend, the old, the old, old pal of um, beer in a lot of ways and um, appreciating it on that level. And I agree, like people are open to it. There's a lot of other like um, interest and kind of openings in beverages right now. Like there's a mead revival that's been happening um, partially because a it is a gluten-free beverage as well. But I find it fascinating because it is such a sweet uh, beverage in general. Um, but uh, yeah, people are absolutely open to it if they're already in a craft beer space. Yeah. Are you pouring much mead there? Uh, we have we have draft mead occasionally. We'll do, we do some bottle pours of meads or like a cherry wine, a really lovely Danish cherry wine right now. And we'll sell canned and bottled meads uh, in our, with right next to our ciders in our cider fridge. So, yeah. And you, you guys are really at the top of the chain in terms of just like quality, <laughs> like especially imports. And, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's on tap right now? We'll switch it to beer for a minute. Like a couple of favorites right now that, that are on tap at Beer Witch. Cause I know it's oh, your, sure. you, by the time you hear this, it's, it's over, but you can still celebrate. They're celebrating their third anniversary this month in October, yeah. so congrats to yeah. Beer Witch. Yeah, just in a few days. Um, let's see. Right now, we've got uh, some OEC locals, Cashmere. It's a great lager. We've got Hill Farmstead, uh, Motueka Double IPA. We've got the New York Cider Company Hop Cider. Um We've got uh, Halfway Crooks, um, really tasty uh, Dortmunder style lager on our, one of the, one of the features our bar has, and we love to nerd out on, are these, the side pole lucre faucets. They're from the Czech Republic originally, and the Czech people, they've just been making lagers for so long, they, you know, changed it up so you can get it's called a Maliko pour, right? Um, so it's this very different textural experience for your beers. Um, and we've also got like a um, foreign export stout on from Ridgeway Brewing in the UK. Um, and, and like, that's the kind of thing where maybe people have never had the opportunity to have a foreign export stout and these more like specific regional historical styles that you don't see too often um that it's just it's a joy for me to just introduce to people um, there's nothing like going to the one thing i love about post-pandemic nothing like going to a really good craft beer bar 
chance to not only taste different styles, but in, in, the, in a certain setting and it's curated, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just one producer or something else. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, back to you. So Northern Spice, your Northern Spice Cider, now you have different farms. What label is that under? That's an, all the ciders are Hudson Valley Farmhouse Cider. So that's your Hudson you. Valley Farmhouse Cider brand. Oh, that's, yeah. 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 So you had that. And one time I had um, the, uh, it, it, was it the Spitzenberg? It, it, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's off that. the Aesopa Spitzenberg. You used to have that around. Aesopa Spitzenberg. We call that Spitz. Um, <laughs> that is such an elegant cider. I took that out. I gave a keynote talk. Excuse me for wheezing a little. Um, we're, we're just happy that you're on. I just, everyone yeah. should know. You're, up, you're, you're upstate. And, 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 uh, are you in Millvale? Is that the town in Hudson Valley? Well, we're in um, Stutzburg and Stone Ridge. Oh. And that's about two hours north of the city? Yeah. 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 Um, so, hey. and actually, one of the farms is pretty close to the town of Asopus, where the Asopus Spitzenberg originated in the 1700s, um, became very important apple. Um, believe it or not, George Washington grew them. Thomas Jefferson grew them. I'm not trying to be part of the, you know, great white father thing, but it's, it's just a verifiable fact. Mm -hmm. These guys both came to New York and bought a sub of Spitzenberg on Long Island at the, in, in Newtown, Flushing, Queens. And these guys bought George Washington. There's correspondence on it. Went with John Adams, who drank cider every day. And they went to Flushing, Queens, Newtown, to the Prince Nursery and bought trees together. Mm -hmm. It's like crazy. It's like some crazy movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these apples have been around for a long time, but very few people are growing them. I took the spits. I gave this big talk at CiderCon, and uh, we poured some of these great old apples. We had a bunch of producers there. Dan Pucci helped put it together. And I w it turned out I was the only person. I had, Lots of people make a Northern Spy, hundreds and hundreds. But I was the only person, it turned out, that I could find in that moment who did 100% a soap of Spitzenberg. I was the only one. I w that shocked me. I thought many more people would have been, um, but, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not, there's not very much of it growing. That's part of it. And the people that are, um, working with it a lot of times are blending it because they don't have enough of the stock. That'll change over time. Um, and the, the other one I'm, I'm looking at, I'm pour the Golden Russet. Golden Russet, this is a New York State Russet. They, they grew thousands of acres of these things, mostly for cider, in Westchester County. Mm. So when we talk about like this apple history we have, it's so big and it's also so disappeared in so many ways. I mean, mm. in my wildest, I can barely imagine anybody growing apples in Westchester. What 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 would it take to, to get more people to grow? I mean, not just in orchards, but in people's yards. Well, I and think all we're that. seeing it. We're seeing yeah. it. And one of the things that happened that we hoped would happen was sort of our fantasy twenty years ago, is that the kids would come back to the farms. And alcohol would lure them back. <laughs> and so I can think of 10 or 20 orchards it, it, practically within earshot, you know, within driving distance where kids have come back to the farms and they're making hard cider. So Dressels are making Huguenot cider and Clark's are about to launch a cider and Locust Grove, Chip Kent is doing cider. He's been there for nine generations, but now they're doing wow. cider. And the Wilclos, who sell in New York, Bad Seed, you know, they're doing cider. And they're all these um, young people. It's mostly somebody under 40. Uh, and I could go on and on. And they've come back to the farm. And you know, it's Indian, Indian the farm's Ladder excited. Farm, right? Indian Ladder Indian Farm. Indian Ladder is another great and example. Who's 1911? Well, 1911 are further upstate, and I actually don't know them well, but they're very, very big growers. And they were growing a lot, kind of, I will say, you know, for the processing, for applesauce and mm. apple juice. And they've been 
you know, they're they're knocking it out of the court. They they brought in a really fine um, winemaker cider maker, and that's the other thing. I mean, we're we're like this is not just stuff that you ferment in the garage. People are really bringing in some talent, and there's an organization we, we basically brought the guy who wrote the book in England, Peter Mitchell, over to the States. And he, there's the Cider Institute of North America. And they've been doing for about five years a lot of really big staff trainings, the American Cider Association. Mm -hmm. There's now a certification program. You, you guys should think yeah. about that. Um, um, I, I am the, on my way to getting that certification. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the level Congrats. one. Yeah, my my uh, my. Boss Krista has that certification, but wow. it's all part you know of what? the educational on, on aspect. On that note, we're yeah. going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes to talk more mm -hmm. about CIDA certification on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City, Long Island, and Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Hey, support us, become a member, heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. We've been on the air now, it's probably almost 15 years. We've been doing Beer Sessions Radio. This is our 14th season. So thanks for your support and check it out, heritageradionetwork.org. So we got Elizabeth Ryan from Upstate Farms and, and uh, Hudson Valley Farmhouse Cider and Fee Doyle from Beer Witch. So Fee, tell us about the... Getting certified for the Cider Institute of North America. I know our friend uh, Ron Sansone has been on the board of that, so I've heard about it, but I never quite knew what it did. Yeah, um, as it's through the American Cider Association, um, it's you know the equivalent of Cicerone in beer or sommelier with wine. Um, but um, so far, I'm I'm studying for level one. The, it's called the CCP. Um, an overview of history of regional regions where cider apples apples are grown. Um, overview of you know when you look at in many food and beverage like the flavor wheel and where even one specific apple if you made. A specific a uh, single apple cider from it, um, where it would hit on the scales of acidity, bitterness, um, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, really uh, in the same way when I like I have a little level one certified beer server certification for Cicerone. In the same way of like elevating beer, um, talking about cider. Um, and as, uh, you know, as technically and as um, glowingly as it deserves to be spoken about. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think, like I said earlier, it's like presenting cider as if it is as delicious and wonderful. And we should be talking about it in the same way that we discuss beer and wine. Um, but I, yeah, again, I'm I'm working on it. So I'm all... <laughs> I'm not as advanced a, a pommelier or <laughs> uh, that kind of advancement. That's fun. Elizabeth, I just heard you pour something else. What, what are you pouring? <laughs> well, first of all, I have to big shout out again to Fee for doing this. And this Yay. is something that 10 years ago, first of all, <laughs> would have been unheard of, unheard of when I started in the 90s. I had to get on a plane and go over there 
because we didn't have a vocabulary here. Mm. So bravo to you. And it just, it just brings me such joy to hear that you're doing this because I realized that we've, we've, we've come a long way in and people do need that vocabulary. So Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but I'm, I kind of cut to the, I have four ciders, but I jumped, I jumped the line here. I couldn't help it because, um, so we've been barrel aging cider forever. And again, what do you need? You need a really fine, good barrel from a really good barrel source. And we've been buying barrels, um, rye whiskey barrels and bourbon barrels from a company called Hill Rock. I don't know if you guys have bumped into them Mm. up in Columbia County doing Solera style. Some say um, it's the best best whiskey whiskey in New York. Yeah, incredible. And so... um, Bourbon barrels can only be used for bourbon once. And so um, we we buy their used barrels. We try to get a wet barrel when we can that's just been dumped. And so normally we do a bourbon barrel aged cider. And we sell through it really fast because, first of all, it's really good. But also beer aged cider in a beer barrel And I try really hard for the cider not to get overwhelmed. And I usually use Northern Spy, by the way. Just, it just feels right. It's iconic. And um, so since COVID, you know, we kind of pulled back and we pulled out of wholesale. We sell a lot in the farmer's markets and at our our farm stand. We're we're beginning to get um, back in wholesale. So we have these incredible um, barrel-aged ciders that we aged longer than we ever would have or could have or intended to. And so we have these ciders that have now been in wood for two or three years. And that's what I'm drinking. I wish you guys could drink it with me. <laughs> so what So what are you doing? Is it, is it too much? Oh, my God. Barrel? I'm just like uh, practically having an orgasm here. I'm sorry. but Is this called the Woody? It's what? like scrumping. That. You're scrumping Scrumping with the Woody? <laughs> Oh, no, it's, did I just say that? Jeez. <laughs> did you just say that? Sure but it's um, it's it's, it's a got, wood bar- you know, it's barrel, you know, wooden it's barrel. It's all, it's all right there. You. It's all right there. Low hanging yeah. fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so the difference, the difference, um, that this cider, when we pulled this cider out of barrel and bottled it, um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was just like, "Are you?" Are you uh, fucking kidding me? Like that was like I tasted it, and it's like I don't even believe how good it is. And so then you ask yourself as a producer, is like, okay, is it merely that it was in wood longer? Is it the inherent quality? Of course, it's all these things. Is it that we put really good cider in? Is it that we, by sheer accident, left it longer? Normally, we're under so much pressure, like to tie up something for two years, you know, and that might not sound like a very long time, but but we 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 don't typically age for two years. It's it's elevates. You also have to keep an eye on it too, right? I mean, you do have to check. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. You lose a lot of it. We probably you lose at least ten or twenty percent of the barrels. I would never have the patience for that. I can't even do I can't even do sourdough starter. I'm like short order cook. No, but a lot of things happened during COVID that were game changers. Mm. And one of the things that happened for me during COVID is I didn't have as big of a staff. And so we were juggling a lot more things. And and anyway, I really I'm the the, one of the reasons So it's a mistake. You just left it. You had to leave. Disappointed it. that I'm not down there with you guys. <laughs> I have to get you bottles of this because really wanted to drink this. We're gonna have you. you down. We're gonna do this again in the winter. You're gonna be in the studio and, with and me the and, me and you. Yeah. So. See, and Jimmy, you guys get the color is so gorgeous. I'm just kind of but more than that, it's it lingers on the palate and it's it gets there's a thing that happens. I'm not that much of an expert but you know the longer you leave things in wood there really is a magic alchemy that happens where you get these caramel notes Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and you you get the long fibers and it's not that raw and and there's no substitution for time like you can't cheat on that it's just got to be in the wood you know i've had some old old school farm ciders where 
the same thing where it was like a raw, you know, heirloom tannic site or whatever you, it is, acid, and it was in a barrel for a year. And th- those are some of my, that's some of my favorite style of ciders. Um, I don't get that too often, but I feel like that's an old school method. Well, it's done a lot. In is it. that what you're talking about or something different? Yeah. And it's got to be decent wood too. That's part of it. So you can't, you can't, you know, Hill Rock is very high end, beautiful. They're, you know, their bourbon sell for, you know, $100, $120 a bottle and using the best wood they can source. And I think that's a factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it affects, I feel like this is what you're saying also, the, the, the mouthfeel really, I have a sense of the wood itself when you are drinking something that has spent that much time in, in a barrel. Um, yeah, really lovely. Yeah. So that's kind of fun. And I have to admit, I skipped over two other ciders (laughs) because, you know, I'm sitting here staring at this bottle and I'm just like, I have to. Well, that's fun. And you know, and Fee brought something cool, whether it's scrumpy or a pet nap, that's a neat, we started a very cool conversation. Is it scrumpy or a pet nat? <laughs> what did you bring, Fee? Because we just drank the whole bottle yeah, while we were sitting we're, here. We're done oh my with God. it. Um, so I've got a bottle from Black Duck Cidery. Uh, they're uh, representing the Finger Lakes region. They're up in Yeah, Ovid. we know them incredibly well. He yeah. does some amazing things. Yeah, and super wonderful. Uh, John, he will hand deliver um, our orders <laughs> and talking about like hand, hand, uh, you know, person to person, uh, development of business, um, from cider to beer. Um, so we're drinking, um, this is called a crim seckle pear cider. So, oh my God. I've had that. That yeah. is so good. It's so oh delicious. Yeah. It's so it's a fruited cider, uh, not a peri. Um, and then it's just fun. It's from their cassette deck series. So this fits in with our love of music as well. Just cool um, picture of a uh, little tape tape here. But uh, so it's a blend of um, seckle pears um, and, uh, and then a crimson crisp apples as well as some crimson. Ta, ta, ta. Where'd they go? One sec. Crimson Topaz. Um, and yeah, um, I think it's on the same lines. It's a wild fermentation, so no um, no yeast pitched or inoculated. Um, it's unfiltered, and you get that lovely, like, mouthfeel of an unfiltered cider. Um, but it has that raw quality. The very raw quality. So what, could yeah. this so be called a scrumpy? Three, those three cultivars, that's a killer combination. Mm-hmm. It, those are great varieties. And um, so right out the gate, and you know, John's John's a real purist. Mm. Uh, what, and I'm becoming kind of a purist. But when, you're, when you do those wild ferments, you always take a chance. Mm. It's not predictable. Like a champagne yeast, you know exactly what it's going to taste like. You know what's going to happen. So it's it's the people that are willing to do this. It's all small batch. It's bold. It's, um, you know, and I think these small batch producers, and we have a lot of big, wonderful producers too, but, you know, these, these small batch producers are really um, kind of sticking their necks out, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Elizabeth and Fee, that's why I got jazzed about Cider Week way back in 2011, because it was meeting all the small producers from, from the Northeast, including New York and, and now New England. And how, and they're not taking chances as much as it's small batch. And it's it's what I love, whether it's indie music, in, in, in indie craft producers. I still love that. And I feel like these indie cider makers are still where it's at. And I'm just really happy that we're, we're talking about this. And scrumpy, let's 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 wrap up and talk about scrumpy first. So scrumpy again, it doesn't sound like much. I know there's an innuendos, but this right now we're drinking something that's raw. It's 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 like a pet nap. It, it, the, I think in this case the, the wine reference is important because everyone seems to say pet nap and they're willing to try it. Um, how do you feel, Fee, as a person who's who's selling and serving people to use that term? 
when you're describing something like this? Does anybody ask for pet nat at Beer Witch? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, we've we've frequently, I think, based on our design aesthetics, um, uh, and uh, we look like a wine bar from ostensibly outside, but we are licensed as such that we don't um, serve wine and, You're a and beer part of our, eating place beer only. Yeah, I'm I, wow. like we can serve gla- uh, wines by the glass, but. Um, but we don't sell any to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a tavern license. Um, and uh, I think it's, I will engage in those terms only when it kind of seems like it's going to benefit the interaction. I, I personally go to describing like mouthfeel, flavor, you know, how it, how the color of the cider in the glass is um, and any kind of general, just the, when you meet the person, you're like, what do they want me to say to them <laughs> so I can sell this beverage to them? Um, yeah, I think Pet Nat and o- orange wine, as I said, mentioned earlier. But um, it's it's interesting to be like aware of these terms. They're not always necessary, but um, they, they're tools, I find. Oh, good. Yeah. And Elizabeth, you wrapped that one up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, really, I'm not sure there's a line between scrumpy and pet nat, no matter what. <laughs> um, and and I think it's, I'm interested, Fee, that you say that you're not, you know, I, I, I still struggle with this, even though I've been doing it for decades. How to communicate to the consumer the right thing. Of course, you mm-hmm. want them to figure it out themselves but um but i find that those words are important i am gravitating a lot towards petting out these days we rarely say scrumpy and part of that is it's just people are like oh pet nat mm-hmm. and they know what it is mm-hmm. scrumpy they're like oh, what 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 so um uh so it's like you, defi- know, you need to find something one thing about beer is that you know there's often a brand or a style and you can reference that. And I guess if you're referencing Pet Nat, then you kind of know what that is. So I get well, it. Well, people yeah. do now. They, they didn't three years ago. And I think it's always the craft small batch producers that are like the tip of the spear. Mm. We're always kind of like leading this. That's how I feel. And we're introducing it in in, in accordance with, with folks like you, Fee, and you, Jimmy. I mean, you guys. But framing this language, and there's there's been – such a long way to come because we had this break in our culture here, right? During pro- prohibition, whatever you think of it. Mm. Um, and I've been finding out a lot more about my own family's adventures in prohibition, which were many, <laughs> and they loved cocktails and they loved going into New York. And so uh, I feel like we're just bringing it home with with cider and beer too. I mean, I feel like it's just like a reset button for America, and that's that's very very exciting. And Jimmy, you know, when we did the first um, first cider week, you know, we had like nine producers there. Remember? Oh yeah. Now we could have two hundred. It's amazing. Um, you, how about we'll wrap it up? You guys each ask each other a question. <laughs> both thoughtful people. Mm. But. Mm. Well, well, I have one, but it's sort of a low, low down question. But I am curious what you look for, Fee, in a cider. Personally, I forget, forget your, you know, but what floats your boat as a beer drinker? Are you looking for tannin or bitters or like what? What is it that that makes you go, oh yeah, huh? Well, uh, I feel like um, something that's mysterious to me about cider is um, when I have like something like what I'm drinking, a a scrumpy or a pet nut, is that it tastes remarkably close to what the experience of the fruit having eating the actual apple is like. And I and I'm not thinking about it as if it's an alcoholic beverage. It's like it, 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 huh. it kind of, it, 
erases something in that part of my brain. And that those are the ciders that I'm like, oh, I just appreciate so deeply. Um, and I, I suppose I, I lean toward medium carbonation and these kinds of like little details, but I like, I appreciate a good amount of acid, um, but, and then tannins as well, just to give your, like a different texture and mouthfeel. But I think it's the, this is the juice of an apple. This is very lizard brain. This is the juice of an apple. Um, <laughs> it's alcoholic, but this is an apple, not like a grocery store apple. So, and um, it, like it, you know, it, it transports me a little bit. Yeah. You know? I, I hope you share that answer in one of those classes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> They'll give you like an A plus. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's recorded for posterity. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think that's very that's very intriguing um, to me. So the fruit really speaks to you in addition to everything else. And I think that is the thing that is elusive when people scale up on ciders mm. and they start they start doing these tight filtrations that they have to do. The first time I filtered my cider, I still remember it in ninety seven. And we were making Maeve, our first, you know, release. And um, we ran it through the filter. And what the filter took out, flavor-wise, I literally cried. And I Mm. drank what was filtered out. And I made the guy who worked for me, I said, drink this. You're drinking the soul of the apple. And we just took it out. (laughs) So... You know, when you're doing these, I think you're drinking a lot of these ciders that are probably unfiltered. Mm. And that's why they're keeping a lot of that aroma and essence and, you know, um, for a lot, you know, fruitiness. And the power to you, Elizabeth, that you've you've stuck with it for so long. Fee, do you have a question for her? I know you do. Yeah. For Elizabeth, I I think it, like, it's inspiring to me as being someone who's younger uh, of a different generation in this beverage space. Like I'm someone who you described earlier, so might come to make cider on a farm or a, a mill. Um, and f- for you who have, you've been working lo- so long in the cider space, is there something like being a woman in the beverage space? <laughs> like I, this could be a whole episode onto itself, but uh, as um, what, I don't know. <laughs> that journey like for you how has that journey been a little bit and what do you think is there something 20 years ago that you didn't know that you might know now and I don't know if it's specific to cider but um I don't know wow there's 10 questions in that yes but, um, <laughs> really good questions Really quickly on the on the women thing, I think historically women have always, you know, done a lot of fermentation and distillation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, there's there's more and more scholarship on it. Um, you know, John Adams didn't make the cider; his wife made it for him. Yeah, um, and that's pretty well documented. Was- but I I will say um, at the time that I was sort of coming into this, and there were very very few role models or mentors, I felt very embraced. Mm. And there were a lot of older men, the first guy that hired me. And uh, <clears throat> he had he had lived and worked in France. And, and, and when he hired me, and I was having so much trouble, I was just telling this story today, in 1980, and like nobody would even interview me or hire me. I wanted to work in the industry and wine then not so much cider and you know mark miller from ben marl winery one of the first farm wineries in new york state and the day he he brought me in and he hired me as vineyard manager for 75 acres of grapes and i bought an orchard but he said to me um you know i really think it's time for the girls to have a chance don't you mm-hmm. and that was a beautiful moment right mm-hmm. and so um I feel like a lot of doors were beginning to open and I was able to walk through them. So that was 
a special time. I don't think it was like that 50 years ago or 100 years ago. That's an amazing answer. So Mark Miller, yeah. he was like the first new like New York State licensed winery, wasn't he? He, started the- he wrote, he literally wrote the bill. He, he wrote, there's this famous picture of him making the governor and he had lived in France. I mean, I think part of the story here is those of us that kind of went to the old world, to Europe, to learn what we could there. Mark had lived in Burgundy and Bordeaux and he was like, like came back here and he was like, what's wrong with us? He bought an old vineyard in the Hudson Valley. Um, and we're trying to revive these old orchards. We're trying to save them. And it's, it is a little daunting because, um, Real estate is worth so much money. So we're we're experiencing, it's like Sonoma now in the Hudson Valley. And um, a lot of these properties, obviously, they're worth more with houses on them. But anyway, I don't think I even answered your question. But I think you did yeah, more than you, you think. Did. Yeah. And I'm going to say, you guys are so awesome. And you know what? We're going to do this again. We're going to come back in the winter when we're all a little quieter and well, slower. Fee, and we're I'm going to come and out. visit you, Fee. And yeah. we're yes. going to pass the torch to you. Yes, and please. I think you should come up to my farm. And I'm going to be down at Cider Feast this weekend. Okay. But uh, anytime you want to come and, you know, ferment some fruit or love have that. a hands-on, you know, yeah. um, Jimmy, of course, our door is always open. You know, we, we are also Jimmy so Carbone. overdue. But whatever it is, we're, we're going to do this again and keep talking deeper. I want to thank you both, uh, Elizabeth Ryan and, and, and Fee Doyle. Thanks so much for joining me here on Heritage Radio Network. Big shout out to our engineer, Armin Spengen. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host on Beer Sessions Radio. Wow, going on 15 years here on Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time. All right. Woo. Hey, it's Cider Week somewhere in America. It's Cider Week t- this week in New York. All right, guys. See ya. Bye. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey, it's Francis Lamb, host of The Splendid Table. Every week on our show, we talk about food and cooking and the meanings of food and cooking. We talk with the most interesting people in food about their techniques, their culture, and everything in between. Whether it's about how fried chicken took over the world or how Instagram changes the way people are actually eating. It's a food show where everyone is welcome. Come join us. You can listen to The Splendid Table wherever you get your podcasts.